shit. <laughs> now you know how I feel following Hank Green. <laughs> well, this is nowhere near as awesome, but um, I'm organizing a proposal. Yes. And I'm going to get a picture of you holding a sign saying, will you marry this girl? Sure. <laughs> of the guild was the uh, Fox and Codex go on not a date. The one where Blade oh, yeah. shows up with the thing and it's like, and, and Fox is like, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm causing strife in your guild? Um, and the reason I love that as much as I do um, is that on the day that we filmed it, it uh, something in the dialogue just wasn't working. It was almost there, but not quite. And Felicia and I rehearsed the scene, we blocked the scene, and then we went to, uh, we went downstairs where the location was, and we just sat at a table and we worked it out, we sort of rewrote it together. And uh, like found exactly, we found the places where we needed to make the changes, and then we went up and we just did it that way. And the reason I'm, I'm, I really like that is it sort of illustrates why uh, uh, smaller budget productions and web video can run circles around big budget studio backed uh, uh, like network shows. If we were on, like if we had tried to do that on Eureka, we would have uh, gone to the writers who were on the set. The writers would have gone to the associate producer in the office. The associate producer in the office would have gone to the showrunner. The showrunner would have gone to the network producers. The network producers would have gone to their bosses. And maybe four days later, we would have gotten an answer. And it probably would have been, no, do it the way we fucking wrote it. Uh, so we were able to make a decision that made the show better uh, in a very short amount of time. Uh, and that's just, I think it's a great example of why we're like little, uh, we're like little vipers and they're base stars. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Next question. Hey, um, I was really excited today when we found out that uh, Hank Green was going to be here. I know, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't bring anything for you, but I made something for Hank in mind. Can I give it to you to give to him? Are you, yeah, Hank, are you back there? You want to come receive a gift? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you get the Hank Green next question? Hello. Hi. Oh, thank you. Uh, last night I found myself in a ice cream shop slash arcade, and my two and a half year old daughter. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Where is this ice cream shop? <laughs> it's in a Ballard neighborhood called Full Tilt. She really wanted to play games, and that excited me. But she really wanted to play games like Street Fighter or Tekken. <laughs> and she's two? Yeah, right. So That's appropriate, though. Like, a two-year-old can probably mash those buttons just as well as an adult kid. <laughs> Was there anything with your kids where you wanted to encourage them to game, but you thought, not right now, or this isn't the right thing, and you felt torn or in a position like that, and sort of how did you handle um, that situation? Sort of. When my kids were little, so they, state of the art for them uh, was, was probably the, um, probably the Super Nintendo, or Nintendo 64, and then uh, GameCube were, the, were like the big yeah. things for them when they, when they were growing up. When they were really little, uh, they played my Sega Genesis. And, and I, um, I mean, that was, I really liked that console, mostly because I just loved the uh, NHL 93. And, um, and, and, and at that time where, um, like, 
where it was sort of like you could play Mortal Kombat on Nintendo, but you're sort of like playing like Mortal Kombat for like children, because um, uh, they like took the blood and the fatalities out and all that, and I was just like, don't tell me what I can play. Um, so I became kind of a Genesis guy. So we had that in the house. And the Genesis had um, what was, at the time, a very complicated controller. And uh, the, the kids just sort of struggled with that. Then we took my wife's Atari 2600 uh, that she got for Christmas in 1977? Yeah? Yes. 77, yes. Um, that she got in 1977, and we uh, let the kids play that. And it was one controller and one button. And those games, those 8-bit games, sort of encourage you to use your imagination. And they want you to be like, like, fill in the story, fill in what's going on, and it's very simple. And most of those games you can play without ever looking at a rule book. You can figure them out in inside of a minute. And our kids, when they were little, loved that. And it was simple, and it was incredibly fun, and I didn't really have to worry about, like, you know, I don't have a problem with violence. I have a problem with consequence-free violence. And uh, when, they're, when kids are little and can't really make the distinction between, like, you know, pretend and, and real, um, I wouldn't let them play games that I thought were, were sort of uh, violent. Uh, in fact, we took the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers game away from them when Ryan was doing a Power Rangers move on Nolan. <laughs> So, um, uh, I, I would actually encourage you, you know, there are tons of either Atari emulators that you can get online, or you can get a flashback or a flashback 2 or something like that, and, and, and put your, 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 your daughter? Yes. Yeah, put your daughter down in front of that and see, and, and, and then watch, in about, inside, of a, inside of about a year, she'll be kicking your ass at combat. <laughs> because I want to bring Hank Green back out to give you one more story. Okay, stop me just quick. I'm turning this into another black altar. I have one of those books that we filled with people writing things to you to give to you again. This is from last pack, this pack's and Joe Goku Crazy too. So I'm just going to run up and give that to you in the next Oh my god, questions. thank you. <laughs> Okay, next question. Uh, in an effort to aid your continuing scientific study to prove that it's impossible to have too many dice, I have a D20 for you. Please bring it forward. Next question. So I'm going to make this really quick. What are your top three games that, if you're stranded on an island, that you would keep? Oh, man. <laughs> That's, that's a tough question. Uh, it would be a game with a lot of replay value that, that changes a lot. Um, I would definitely take uh, a, a role-playing system with me. Um, I would take this game that exists in my imagination that is sort of like that game Mousetrap, except, uh, except you use it to build... You're very excited about Mousetrap. Did anyone ever actually play Mousetrap? I just built it. Game. I just built the mousetrap and like set it off. Um, but I would, I would take a game with me that's very similar to Mousetrap that's called uh, Transportation Back to Civilization. <laughs> and, you, and you build it all together and then it actually works. <laughs> and, uh, and of course a deck of cards. Uh, less of a question, more of a comment. Uh, at Acquisition Inc. yesterday, you threw your D20 into the crowd? Yes, I did. Fuck that guy. Uh, <laughs> it, Bounce off the top of my head, so I'm the one who managed wow. to get that. It's pretty impressive that that die can hit anything. <laughs> I have five minutes left, so this will be the last question, and then we're going to bring Hank Green out, and he's going to play us some more music. If I remember right, you grew up in Southern California? I did grow up in Southern California, the San Fernando Valley, to be specific. That's right, 818 represent! <laughs> It was actually 213 when I lived there. That's how I was. Damn kids. I'm going to yell at an empty chair in a minute if you keep me going. I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. As someone who grew up in Nebraska, what the hell convinced you to come to Kansas after school? Ah, there was, um, I, went, I went and lived in Kansas for a little while. It was actually a very important part of gathering experience uh, for me. It was sort of like, it was, it, was, uh, it was a main story quest in my life. 
I, I moved to Kansas to work for New Tech, and I helped develop the Video Toaster 4000, which was really important to me. If any of you guys here use any sort of nonlinear editing systems at all, if you use iMovie, or Final Cut or, uh, or anything like that. I worked on the product that is the root of that particular creative tree. And it was really important to me because we were making a disruptive technology that was fundamentally going to change the world. If we had made the video toaster at a time where YouTube existed, uh, we would all be hanging out right now on my private yacht. <laughs> we would have made tens of millions of dollars. As, as it turns out, we just were way too early. Uh, we made technology before there was distribution, and that had to happen in Kansas. It was actually really good for me because I had been an actor my whole life, I had been on a series for a really long time, and I kind of was like, I was on the way to like, I was, I was getting dangerously close to the pash, path of the douchebag because I lived in Hollywood, that's all I was around all the time, and I remember waking up every day and just not liking the person I saw in the mirror. And I thought, I need to sort of like, go figure out like, what the fuck is going on with me in my life? And, and find, like, I gotta find out what matters to me. And I went to Kansas and I, and I worked on the video toaster for a long time and I was completely away from everything I had ever been around. And I spent about two years doing that and I realized that what really matters to me is uh, being creative and acting and writing. And I came back to uh, Los Angeles after that and uh, went back to acting school and then struggled like crazy for about 10 years and uh, then got really lucky and was kind of in the right place for all the hard work I had done to actually pay off. Um, and I think there's a little bit of a lesson there, you know, it's not really like that thing about like wherever you go, there you are. Like you can't run away from yourself, but you can take yourself to a place where you're forced to really look at yourself and be honest about what you like and don't like and then do what you need to do so that you remove the douchey things and become more awesome. And uh, you know, for a lot of people that happens in college, and for me, it happened in Kansas. Thanks for your question.